today we kick off a brand new series called Life Hacks, when you just need a better way. Now, if you're not familiar with the term life hack, it's just a fun way of saying, like, you could do something small, something maybe unique, something maybe sometimes even silly, that would, like, make your life a whole lot better. Like, for example, when you... Uh, would go on an airplane, remember those things, when you would travel and you would get on an airplane and you bring your suitcase and your luggage and you check it in and you get on an airplane and then you fly to your destination and you got off, you know, you had a great flight, you'd go find the baggage claim and then all the bags started rolling off of your carousel, you know, whichever one, you had to probably run to the one that you didn't think it was at, but then all of a sudden you realize that everyone on the airplane had the same luggage as you. Like imagine that, a black, kind of rectangular suitcase, you know, it's like what? everyone seemed to pack the same exact thing and you had to check all of the name tags on there, you know, is this mine, is this my clothes, like, like what if, what if instead of like trying to sort through all of that, what if you just like tied a pink bow on your luggage and so when you fell off the thing, you know, you'd be able to, oh, there's my thing all the way over there, you're not sorting through all these ones that look exactly the same, uh, that's an example of a life hack. It's just a, a little simple thing. And if you did research online, life is completely different because of this. But this series also gives us an opportunity to talk about the idea that some things are better than other things. Like, I think we would all agree that the Eagles are better than the Cowboys, <laughs> and chocolate is better than vanilla, and dogs are better than cats, right? right? <laughs> But let's think about filling the dishwasher for a second. <laughs> Isn't there a better way to fill the dishwasher? You know, you've never had, I know it's just me, but you've had all these dishes, you know, lined up in your sink and on your countertop and, you know, it's just plates and bowls and cups and all this stuff. And then you open the dishwasher to put them in and you're like, oh man, the dishwasher's full. There's like four plastic large Tupperware bowls in there and you're like, I guess I gotta run the dishwasher and come back a couple hours later, pull the big bowls out, then I can load everything else in. It's like, no, no, no. Like, there's a better way for this, right? You take the bowls out, you put everything in the way it's supposed to go, all nicely organized. Then you run the dishwasher, you know, that takes care of itself. And then there's this thing called dish soap and you put it in the bowls and you swish it around and then like two minutes later you got clean bowls and you got a full dishwasher that's running. like. There's a better way to organize the dishwasher. And somebody said amen for the first time in their life, because that means a lot to you, right? <laughs> Some things are just better than other things, and we can all agree on that. But some ideas are also better than other ideas. And this is where we start to step on some people's toes because we live in such a pluralistic world where everybody's ideas are should be treated equally and seen fairly and you know whatever you believe like you just believe it and that's cool for you and then whatever I believe you know I'm gonna believe and that's cool for me and like we can all be right you know if I believe something that contradicts what you believe to be true we can't both be right. Like, that's just logic. You know, if, if you think two plus two equals five, like, you can believe that. Like, I think it's important to fight for the ability to believe whatever you want to believe. Like, we should have the freedom to believe anything. But two plus two equals five, you can believe that. Two plus two, I believe, equals four. That's what I've been taught. That's what I've been told. That's just logic. And they can't both be right. Like, you can believe 2 plus 2 equals 5, but you'd be wrong. Like, there are some ideas that are just better than other ideas. And the same is true when it comes to faith and religious ideas. Like, some ideas are just better than other ideas. So like in the Bible, we read about a belief system, a religious system, 
that there was people that would uh, sacrifice their infants, their babies, on an altar, where, uh, like a burning sacrifice, and they would put the babies on the altar, and then they would bang drums because they didn't want to hear the babies screaming, you know? So they, the babies are being sacrificed, they're being burned, and they're banging drums because, like, that's just crazy. They're sacrificing these babies to the god of Moloch. And you say, okay, like, that belief system is like, that's cool, you do that. And like Jesus over here, like if you believe in Jesus, like that's good too. You know, it's like they're both, they're both could be the same. They both could be right. It's like, like burning babies or like loving your neighbor. Like, like one is better than the other. One is better than the other. And you could think about it in the modern day practice. I searched for some modern day religious spiritual practices of something called a sky burial. And there's different forms of this, but basically the people in this culture would, would bring their, their deceased, their loved ones who had passed away, they'd bring them up to the top of a mountain and they kind of leave them there for the vultures to pick at. And the vultures, they believe, would take the soul into heaven. And like, you could believe that. I mean, just think about all of the work that has to be done and all the ickiness of, all of that. You know, like you could believe that. You could live that way. Or you could live one of the thousand other belief systems or religious systems that are out there. And I don't know about you, but I want to live the best one. Like I, I want to live the one that is true, the one that is right, the one that will actually change my life. And I believe that one is Jesus. Like Jesus is the best choice, the best answer, the only way to eternal life. He is the best way. But maybe, maybe you aren't convinced of that just yet, and that's all right. You're totally welcome here. But I'm convinced, and maybe you're convinced too. And if you are convinced that he is the best way, the only way, then the question becomes, what difference does this make in your life? Like, how does he actually change your life, impact your life? And does anybody even know that you believe that Jesus is the best way, that you've found the best way? See, at some time in your life, somebody has to know that you believe in Jesus and that you think that he is the best way, the only way to eternal life. Somebody's got to know. You've got to show it, you've got to live it, you've got to proclaim it, and you've got to announce it. And speaking of announcing it, that's our life hack for today. We announce stuff all the time, don't we? And announcements are expensive. <laughs> like it just, it takes a lot to work to announce stuff. Like you're announcing a birth of a baby, you're announcing a wedding, uh, an engagement, you're announcing that you are dating on, by changing your social media status. You know, we announce stuff all the time, a graduation, a new job. I came across something this week, uh, maybe last week. Uh, it, was, it was somebody, you've probably seen this before, where you could pay somebody like a couple hundred dollars, depending on who they are, to like send you a personalized video and they'll say whatever you want to say. It's kind of it's kind of interesting. Um, so I was tempted to do that for today. Like that'd be cool to have like Mr. Celebrity over there say, "Hey, welcome to Connect Us Church." You know, come on in. Like uh, you could do it. I mean, I think they'd do it. You just pay them enough money, they would do it. But I I found this video on Facebook. Somebody got them to announce their baby, their birth of their baby, and it was like this famous announcer guy. You know, it's like. Weighing in at nine pounds, two ounces, he's 22 inches long, his name is Zachary Hoover. That's my little, uh, you know, little audition, you know, I'll take it, I'll take it. But it's, it's interesting, it's an interesting way to do announcements. Uh, you could also go like the old school way and get something printed on a piece of paper. And you know, there's expensive pieces of paper out there. Somebody put a lot of work into that design. It looks beautiful. It looks awesome. And you could go online and buy all those things. And it's, I mean, it costs you a fortune just to send out some invitations. 
So my life hack for today for you about announcements is like you can go online to some free software, free web apps, and use some templates and put your information in about that thing and then export it as a JPEG and then take that JPEG file, upload it to Amazon Photos and then get a bunch of little five by seven photos printed, nine cents a piece. A lot of people do this with Christmas cards. And uh, we did this with prayer cards before we started the church. Nine cents a piece, it's just a fun little way to get the word out, to share it in a way that uh, doesn't cost a fortune. So how would anyone know about your wedding or your baby shower if you didn't announce it to the world. Like if no one knew when it was happening or where it was happening, nobody could come to it. And the same is true with our faith. Our faith in Jesus is something that happens on the inside. Like, you make the decision to believe in Jesus. You apply what he did on the cross. He died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day to give you new life. And that happens in a moment. You're saved. You're forgiven. You're redeemed. You're restored. You're born into the family of God. And it happens. It could happen right here. And it could happen right now with a simple prayer, a simple shift of belief, a simple act of saying, God, I I believe this. I believe in you. And no one can really see that. But God gave us something special to make what happens on the inside that no one can really see public on the outside. He gave us baptism. Baptism is a public outward demonstration, a declaration, announcement of your inward faith in Jesus. And you might think, that's a little strange of an announcement to get in the water, to get all wet, to go under the water. Like, what if he doesn't let me back up? You know, <laughs> is there another way to do it? Is there another way that's less strange? But this whole idea of going into the water and coming up out of the water, it's a beautiful picture of the gospel. It's a beautiful picture of what Jesus did for us. And I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 6. And if you don't have your Bible, that's all right. The words will be on the screen behind me. And we'd love to give you a free Bible before you leave today. But in Romans chapter 6, we read about this beautiful picture of baptism. And Paul writes this to his letter to the Romans. He says, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? And then he says, of course not. The hardest no possible in the Greek language. No way. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Jesus Christ in baptism, we were joined with him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we have also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that our sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know that we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. And when he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. It's the picture. It's the picture of what God has done for us in baptism, in the symbol of baptism. So when we go into the water, like the act of going into the water is symbolizing Jesus dying. And then going under the water is is Jesus being buried. Like Jesus was dead. Like multiple days dead. And then coming up out of the water is symbolizing Jesus coming back to life, coming out of the grave. It's the picture. It's a beautiful picture of baptism of what Jesus has done for us. 
And then you're like, well, what does that mean for me? Like, that's cool. Jesus did that. What about for me? And that's when Paul continues. When he says that we know our sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. How many of you know that sin is powerful? Like sin controls us. Sin controls the way that we think, the way that we respond to situations, the way that we react. Sin's got its grip, its chain. It's, it's strong. It's powerful. But when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Like those that are identified with Jesus, that are believers in Jesus, with God in your life, that power of sin that is so strong on us. And you're like, power, the sin's not strong in my life. It doesn't have any power in my life. I do whatever I want to do. It doesn't control me. That's probably when it's the most strong because you're not even aware of what it's doing to you. But when we die with Christ and he came back from the dead, he conquered sin, conquered death, and now there is no more power of sin in a believer's life. Like you can be set free. You are set free. It's like living in the reality of what God has made for you, that you are alive. You are made new, that that power of sin in your life doesn't have to control the way that you live any longer, that you are not bound by that. You are not slaves to that anymore. Because when he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. There is new life, new power to be found to overcome sin, that habit, that thing that you've been dealing with, that way of thinking that just can't be broken. I mean, with Jesus, he, he breaks it. He gives you, sets you free. And so we see with baptism this powerful visual, a powerful symbol of an internal reality. You're like, what does it look like to live for God? How do you know? <laughs> it's hard to see it. But baptism gives us a visual picture of it. And again, it's a picture. It's a symbol. The water is not magical. There's no special feeling that you get. You know, God doesn't come down and give you goosebumps that you've been waiting for your whole life. It's just, it's just a, a picture and if it's just a picture, like, why bother, right? Why bother getting wet? Why bother figuring out the logistics of it? You know, can't I just change my social media status to Christian? So here's where the sermon is going to take its first turn. I'm going to, we're doing announcements today in multiple different ways. And uh, one of my, I don't know if it's favorite, but least favorite one of my fascinating announcements has been gender reveals. Anybody ever been a part of a gender reveal announcement party? Yeah, okay. I've never been a part of one. So I figured, why don't we do it at church? <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. I need somebody who's willing to come up here and help me to come up and give me a hand. You gotta, you're going to cut a gender reveal cake. Anybody up for it? All right, Joy. Joy's going to come up. We got one more later in the service, so think about it. All right, Joy, come, come and stand behind this. All right, so me and the girls spent some time baking this cake. Let me set it up for you. Here's, here's, your, um, here's your knife. And uh, it's an angel food cake, so you're going to, like, you have to saw it a little bit. If you try and go right through, it's just going to be uh, smashed. And then we're going to cut, like, a square, like a triangle, and then scoop it with that thing, and then people can, you can hold it up. So hold on one second. So here's, here's what's going to happen. It's an announcement, okay? It's, it's, a, it's an, something that's going to change the direction of the sermon, right? So if she picks... The blue side of the gender reveal cake, we're going to talk about Jesus and that the reason that we do baptism is one of the reasons is, is that Jesus set the example for us. Jesus himself was baptized and uh, he commanded his followers, 
his disciples to baptize other people. So we're going to talk about that. Or if she chooses the pink side of the gender reveal cake, then we're going to talk about how baptism is a picture of how the Holy Spirit baptizes us. And the water baptism is just a symbol of what God does in us when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and all the reality that comes with that. Because again, why do we get dunked in water? Why do we do all of that? Why do we make a big deal about it? Well, these are two answers, but I can only preach on one. So Joy, pick a side, cut a cake. There we go. Good sawing motion. Uh, it doesn't matter the size, no. <laughs> All right, can we scoop it? Hold it up for everybody to see. Isn't this exciting? Gender reveals. It's like amazing. There it is. It's a, it's a boy. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Minimalness. All right, thank you. All right, now you're wondering, did I rig that? You know, was the other side blue too? I know, I prepared two different sermons for today. I did. So Jesus sets the example of being baptized. And we read about this in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verse 6, it says, After his baptism, Jesus came up out of the water, and the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And notice the little phrase here about what Jesus did when it came to his baptism. He came up out of the water. That means he had to be in the water in order to come up out of the water. It's just a little words that give us indication of how Jesus was baptized he, by submersion into water. The Greek word for baptism is baptizo, which literally means to dip or immerse. It was used in other contexts in ancient Greece where a white cloth was dipped into like a blue dye. And so the white cloth went in and identified with the dye and when it pulled out when the, you know, it came out, the white cloth was no longer white, it was blue. It identified with the color of the, the dye. And the same is true as a believer in Jesus, as we're identifying ourselves with Jesus, is, you know, you go in and it's just this identification of, I'm identifying with what Jesus did, I'm applying it to me, and I'm coming back, you know, coming out of the water, celebrating all that Jesus has done for us. The other thing that Jesus did when he talked about baptism was that he gave his followers this mission, this great commission. We've talked about this before, but it's so important and so powerful for us believers today. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So baptizing is a commanded by Jesus to his disciples to go and to baptize people, which means that more people are becoming disciples of Jesus. Like we want more people, more people to believe in Jesus, more people to be baptized, more people to, to take that step of faith, to be baptized, to publicly proclaim their faith in Jesus. And then it's our job as disciples, as, as a church, to teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that Jesus has given us, to grow in their faith, to, to mature in their faith. And one of the biggest things about following Jesus is that you're actually doing what he's called you to do. You're on mission for him, which means that you are making disciples and that you are having a role in baptizing people. And so we want new people, more people getting baptized, and those people growing in their faith so that they can then turn around and baptize more people who grow in their faith and who turn around and baptize more people. It's this more people and better disciples, more and better disciples. Jesus gives us this beautiful picture and this mission of what he's called us to do. 
<clears throat> and it's really, it's really a remarkable thing. Uh, what Jesus did for us on the cross during his life here on earth 2,000 years ago that makes a difference in our life, in our world today. And when he ascended into heaven, he gave us, his church, his, his followers, the promise of the Holy Spirit that would empower us and that it would be even better for Jesus to go away so that the Holy Spirit can come. And it's just, again, it's just an amazing thing that the baptism pictures. All of these inward things, all of these things that you can't really see, all of these things that you can't really wrap your mind around, baptism gives us a picture of it. And when we do baptisms, we, we announce our faith, we proclaim our faith, we, we shout our faith to the world, we display it to everyone. Sort of like the way that we do announcements. So, gender reveal. Number two. I need somebody, I told you, I need somebody else to come up and help me out today. Is it a boy or is it a girl? Come on, somebody. Oh, the name's coming. We're resourceful here at Connect This Church. We got reusable utensils. All right. So here's the deal. Oh, see, I told you I prepared for both. All right, so uh, if it's blue, I'm going to tell you a story now about how I gave a promise ring to Alicia and how that was a powerful announcement between me and her that we were going to get married. And then, or if it's pink, then I'll tell you how I was baptized and a little bit of my baptism story. <laughs> I only got one mouth, so. Does anyone have a dart? <laughs> Whack! So this might be loud. If you don't want it to be loud, you can close your ears. But you can choose this one. Or that one. There's probably going to be a whole bunch of confetti inside, right? That is, that is true. Okay. I would much rather clean up the confetti over here than over the piano, so I'm going to go over here. <laughs> Three, two, one. <laughs> That's a big mess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vadim. Man, all right. It's a boy. Here, I mean, I know we want to be good, but can't we just pop that one, too? I thought you were going to talk about uh, the promise ring. I am. I will. But I just want to show you that this will be pink, I hope. There we go. Beautiful. Beautiful. We'll sleep it up. So, <laughs> thank you, Vadim. Let's, let's give Vadim a hand. Woohoo! There we go. We love our interaction here. So, um, the promise ring story. <laughs> I told you a couple weeks ago that when I first started dating Alicia, who is now my wife, um, it was kind of a rocky start. Like, I kind of used her for her car for multiple things, especially for going to this Adams Road ministry event. Um, and she kind of was aware of that, and we can talk more about that dating thing later. Um, but then, a couple months after that, we, we had our first kiss, and it was amazing. Uh, as we have a special day for that, and, and, I, and I knew that when we kissed for the first time that I had just kissed my wife. I, I just knew that that was, that was kind of cool. Um, but really, up until that point, I hadn't really asked Alicia to be my girlfriend. Like, I just didn't. That was just part of that was just the way that I view dating um, and, and think about dating, which is strange and it's weird. And, and maybe I think there's some value to it. But I mean, hey, I was it worked out for me, but I have no idea how. Um, but up until that point, I mean, I didn't really know. I mean, I didn't really ask her, like, would you go out with me or would you be my girlfriend? Like, that wasn't really a, what we did. And again, we can talk more about that another time. But that context of kind of like that unknown that like we haven't really decided, you know, what, I don't know what this is or whatever, you know, it's important because when it moved into now, okay, we're going to get engaged, we're going to get married, 
Um, like these are big steps for us. And up until this point, you know, we've been dating for maybe four years or so. And the plan was to get married the year after or the month after Alicia graduated from college. So she went for six years. She's Dr. Alicia. And then so the summer before her sixth year, we were going to get engaged. And we kind of had this planned out. She kind of knew generally that that summer was going to be so we'd have a year to plan for the wedding, get all the announcements out for all of that and all that fun stuff. Um, but what she didn't know was that the year before that, like the fourth year that I graduated from college, actually I think it was the, in the winter time of that, or maybe the winter of next last year, I forget exactly when. But I wanted to give her like this promise ring. And the promise ring, if you're not familiar with that concept, um, some may be a relatively new thing, but it's like, hey, uh, we're going to get engaged, we're going to get married, but like... It's not happening right now, <laughs> um, but I, I promise that it will. And so we, we, I went over to, out to Pittsburgh, me and, my, me and a friend, and, and Alicia went to Pittsburgh, um, and we went on to Mount Washington. If you're familiar with Pittsburgh, you know it's this awesome mountain that overlooks the city. It's beautiful, you know, all the lights. It's late at night. It's dark outside. And, and I told my friend to kind of, like, walk away. And so me and Alicia are standing on the rail overlooking the beautiful city of Pittsburgh, and uh, I pull out this ring, and uh, let me just say, there's nothing special about the ring. Like, it wasn't a ring pop ring, but it wasn't, like, it wasn't that great. And uh, I pulled the ring out, and I told her, I said, it's not an engagement ring. And she was just completely surprised. Um, I said, you know, we have this plan that we're going to get engaged soon. We're going to get married, you know, this time. But, like, I was graduating from college, and she was going into like her doctorate stuff, and like we were moving, and I was starting a job. Like there was a lot of things that were changing, and I just felt like I wanted to give her something that showed like no matter what was going to happen in our life, like here's a symbol that we're going to do this thing, and it's going to be us, and I'm going to promise that like me and you, like we're gonna we're gonna do it, and like it was it was awesome, it was. It was really great and incredible moment in like in our relationship and it was all a surprise to her. But this announcement, this this way of displaying this thing that was inside of me and like it was between me and her. Like it wasn't anything flashy, it wasn't anything big. Like our engagement was pretty awesome. <laughs> um our wedding was again, it was pretty cool. But this promise ring thing, I mean it was just me and her standing on the edge of the mountain, looking out, you know, over the city. But it was meaningful because it was, again, it was a symbol of something. Like, how do you, how do you describe love? How do you describe relationships? You know, where are you at in this dating thing? But this thing was just a little symbol that, you know what, we were going to get through this. And we were going to do this together. And I think baptism is sort of like that. Like again, there's nothing special about the thing. You know, it's not maybe this grand thing that changes everything. Like the moment I gave Alicia that promise ring, we weren't engaged. We weren't married. You know, nothing really changed. But it was a symbol that showed my love and my commitment to her. And baptism is, is a similar, similar thing. It's just that outward way of showing that, this, yes, this is what is happening. This is what I'm going to be doing. And so, how do you announce your faith to your world? Do the people around you know that you're a follower of Jesus? Do your neighbors know? Do your coworkers know? You know, it doesn't have to be anything impressive or big or strange. You don't have to wear a name tag that says Christian or, you know, it's just real, authentic. Like Jesus, save me. Jesus is my savior. He is my Lord. This is a real thing. And now because it's real in my life, like my life is going to show up. My life is going to be different as a result of it. And these announcements, these these displays these these proclamations like announcements call people to action 
It's why we do announcements at church, because we want to remind ourselves the mission of why we're here. We're, we're welcoming people to connect them to God's next step for their life. And then there's usually one thing that should apply to mainly everybody that we want to invite you to be a part of. Like it's an announcement time where you can take a step in action. And so next week, we're going to do baptisms. That's why we're spending a lot of this time talking about baptism. And next week, it'll be a little bit about baptism. But I'm going to ask the people that are going to get baptized two questions. And those questions are, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And number two, do you want to follow Jesus with your life? And if you can answer yes to both of those questions, then you should get baptized next week. Like you should, because it's showing your faith. It's showing your, their faith, proclaiming your faith in that way. And maybe you've gotten baptized a long time ago. And you're like, I did that a long time ago. That's cool. But here's the question for you that I'm always challenged with. Is who is getting baptized because of you? Like who have you been praying for? Who have you been caring for? Who have you been sharing Jesus with? And now they are being baptized as a result or, or as an influence from your ministry to them, your service to them, your love for them. Like that's a good challenge for those of us that have been believers uh, for years, maybe. Uh, who's getting baptized because of you? And if you can't answer yes to both of those questions, have you put your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And do you want to follow him with your life? then that's okay. I invite you to keep coming, keep engaging with us, asking questions, learning more, and that first step group is the place for you. We'd really love to have you be a part of it. You know, baptism isn't a part of a long, or the result of a long process. It's a first step. It's a beginning of a new life following Jesus. And this could be you right now, today. One of the verses in the Bible in Mark 16, verse 16, says, Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. Notice, it doesn't say, anyone who refuses to be baptized will be condemned, which means separated from God, you know, facing judgment. It says, refuses to believe. So, what do you need to do in order to be saved? Get baptized? No. No. You believe. If you believe, you're saved. But there is a close connection with believing and being baptized, as we can see in a verse like this. But again, baptism, the physical act, the, 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 the method of going under and coming up out of the water, like nothing special is going to happen. God's not going to give you a special handshake and a, you know, a pat on the back to say, okay, now you're mine. Now, now I know you're really saved. Like that's, like that's, not, that's not it. It's our faith in Jesus is what saves us and what he's done for us. He died, he was buried, and he rose again so that when you believe on him, you will be saved. The Bible says that if you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so I want to give you the opportunity now just to pray with me and just pray that uh, you know, maybe you're trusting in Jesus for the first time. And you say, you just pray something like this. Say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm believing in you. I know that you died for me. I know that you paid the penalty for my sin, that you were buried, and that you rose again to give me new life. I want you to forgive me. I want you to save me. And I want to live my life for you. In Jesus' name, amen. And hey, if you did that, I invite you to be baptized with us next week. Uh, and, and for those of us that, again, have made that decision before, a long time ago, like who in your life will be getting baptized eventually because of you?